finally got around to promising, getting around to a song that was promised for years. It is Friday, yep, gotta check Karina's calendar, November 14th. Hey, Karina, I need a new calendar for next year. Um, and it is, uh, it's been, a, it's been, uh, well, I have to confess, it's been a really fun week for me, but it's partly because I've been obsessed with problems. But let me tell you about those later. Um, what I want to talk about today, speaking of Angie, I gotta, I gotta remind you guys of something that is a really, really valuable tool. Something I didn't use for a long time, just because the, the occasion never really arose until I got back to work on Angie. And remember, do you know what? I gotta hear this thing slower. And inspired me to dig up Song Surgeon again, and turned out I had a really old copy and it wasn't working anymore. So I, uh, I tracked down the guys at Song Surgeon, got the upgrade to Song Surgeon 4, and it is, it does stuff, I ended up using it this week for two different things, completely unrelated. I didn't even know it did the third, the second one. And that was, got it, used it to slow down Angie so that I could hear Davies. And get that. Anyway, and get that really precise. So it really came in handy for, for the short little lesson I did on Angie. Well, I say short because I really just broke down Davy's version. And we'll, right now I'm using Song Surgeon again to break down Bert's version. And Paul's, I don't want to talk too much about Paul's. I'll save that for later. I've got a problem with, with the, all the different versions of his I'm hearing. Uh, anyway, I've got a little of the same problem with Bert. Wait a minute, let me get not on that soapbox. Let me, let me get back to earth and get to what I really want to talk about. Um, the other thing that Song Surgeon came in really handy for this week was the ragtime kick that I've been on, which has been part of the obsession, which I'll get to more of that in a second. It ties into everything that was going on, on or things that, that Michelle brought up on the forum. Uh, was It made me dig out my old ragtime LPs and finally transfer them uh, onto into my iTunes so that I could listen to them anywhere and in, in the house and constantly over and over and over. And um, as with a lot of old records, a lot of hisses and pops on there and then all of a sudden I'm reading the, the instructions for um, Song Surgeon and it says, hey, it can remove hisses, pops, and you can EQ things differently. And I found out, man, if you lower the, the, if you have the 31 band equalizer that comes with it, if you notch down around 4K, that is about where the hiss is on these records. It really didn't affect what I was hearing on the piano. Anyway, so uh, Jim Todd and his, his brother and his family put together this cool product that um, I can't recommend enough. I'm gonna, I, well anyway, it came in really handy for me cleaning up some old scratchy records along with, um, of course, being able to slow down Angie and hear what's going on. Um, okay, I think that's it for the Angie story. I'm still going get, to get to more later. With well, the other new stuff that came out this week was, I want to thank Vanessa. Vanessa didn't really elaborate too much on her cool trip. I hope she does more, but Vanessa was, was on a cruise last week with some, and I think you guys probably saw her post on the forum, with some pretty cool artists. So um, let's hope she gets, uh, hopefully gosh, she got some video or something, or at least got to play with some of those guys a little. I don't think so. Anyway. Be uh, be hopefully talking to Vanessa later, a little later today, but after I'm done shooting this. So anyway, that was uh, so. Oh, the song that she, that we, she did for us this week was uh, Snow Patrol, Chasing Cars. Very cool little acoustic thing. Um, what else? We got to a little bit more of the ear training. I'm winding down phase two of the ear training. We're getting into where we're hearing. Hopefully, you're hearing the difference between this chord and this one. And this one. So we're talking about listening to seventh chords now, and we're staying. The, the, really, the only thing I have left to get through in this segment is, or in this phase, phase two, is I'll tell you about it later. But it basically, has to do with hearing a few chords outside of the key, the second circle. Coming up. Uh, oh, what else did we get to this week? Gears fast enough. I'm gonna pay for this in a minute too when I try to do something really silly. It's 
the C section, of, or section C as we might call it, of uh, The Good Life that I don't think I put this in the notes, but I really borrowed that from an earlier, at least the first, for the first theme. Which I probably borrowed in the first place, but that, that's in, um, uh oh, that was in a different rag of mine, Leapfrog Rag. Anyway, um, Cobble Creek, I think, that album. But so, so one of the things I was trying to do with The Good Life, aside from making it sort of playable, was also trying to use a lot of cliches in it. So yes, there's stuff in there that should sound familiar for one reason or another, because it's stuff that typically happens in rags. And so in the third part of it, uh, which was sometimes called the trio for a few reasons, one is it was the third part, but it also is played with three melodies sometimes, and, and this, this kind of comes from a classical term. A little two note harmony, mostly thirds, well all thirds right there, um, as far as what, what we're hearing in there. So. Uh, Winding that song down, got one more part to get to. Might hold off a week or two on that until I see if anybody's actually trying it. So let me know if anybody's tackling the good life. Gene, Scott, I know you guys have, have said you were thinking about it, but get back to me on that. Um, what else do we have? Oh, I have hardly ever taught anybody. strumming version of Here Comes the Sun. And now that Fred is working on it, I hope uh, anybody else that's working on it out there can benefit a little bit from, from uh, Fred's, the mini-series of Fred as we, as we start running through that. So, uh, that was the other thing. We did, did a fly on the wall, broke up our little, our, our Sandy mini-series. Uh, it's been four or five weeks of her working on, um, you know, the guitar geography stuff. Let's see, I have some other questions I want to get to. Okay, I talked about that. Um, big hand movements. Willem. I think you're asking about, I'm not really 100% clear of the question, but it seemed like it was, um, if, if you're making too big a stroke down here, can that contribute to losing the time? I don't think it can. If, but I, but I, need, to, I need to see a video or something, man. So, as long as the motion is constant, it's when you do something like this, that, now that was, that was like totally not, with any kind of steady motion. So, um, so a big stroke is okay. Matter of fact, it probably is better because I think if you're taking small strokes, you're moving slower and it's easier to move, um, to keep a steady beat going faster. That's why if, if the beats in a song are going very slowly, if these are the quarter notes and you're trying to strum it at um, eighth note per stroke, difficult to do that. At that slow speed, you're better off going twice as fast here, doing every eighth as a down, sixteenth note strokes, I know you thought a C was coming, huh? Me too. I decided I'm going to do something different. Michelle's question about uh, giving up. The whole giving up thing is really interesting because uh, there are a bunch of, there are a few times when I came close to giving up on songs, and I, the one I'm going to talk about right now, I did 20 years ago. I said this is impossible, and I might even try to play. Uh, I don't know. I hope I hope I don't try to play too much of it because it's still pretty butchered. But where I'm going with this is when you hear somebody. When you hear Lindsey Buckingham play something, you say, okay, you know what, I know that's possible because he's playing it. When you hear Steve Howe play it, you know it's possible. When you hear Tommy Emanuel, you know it's possible. It doesn't mean it's going to be possible for everybody. But those guys also all have certain things that they've, certain moves that are comfortable for them to do. And, and a lot of those moves are going to be really uncomfortable for a lot of people out there. 
In this, in the particular case of never going back again, the idea of a, of a two-string bar with your little finger, getting your little finger strong enough to be able to do that really would require even practicing this, making a hinge bar and pulling it, you could practice this just pushing it down on your thumb. Getting it stronger, the same way your third finger needs to be able to do a hinge, this is independent of the guitar, if you practice pulling that down to your thumb so that this knuckle hyper, uh, hyper extends, or that joint, and the same thing with your little finger, eventually you'd find that you might be able to get that note in there. There is not really going to be a way to bar two notes on the, on the top two strings with this finger being straight, pushed down like that. You're going to have to get it bent, something like that. Now, I didn't really mean to go into the technique of improving that as much as the real strategy that I wanted you to employ here was if you don't, you can always change it like I was getting at there. And the simple solution to this was, as you figured out, I was just about to, I was, when I was writing this thing, as I was writing that forum post, I was thinking, here's the easy solution, and I thought, no, wait, wait, wait. Just steer them in the right direction. Good work. You figured it out. It was just play the top string and let the second string be what turns out to be the third of the chord. And then we have, we even have a fuller sound in the chord than Lindsay was getting. How do you like that? Uh, okay, so, so that's the solution, or a solution. When Reverend Gary Davis tried to play Maple Leaf Rag, did it sound like this? No, it was this. Okay, it was his own approach. His approach was not to try to play what the piano played. Now when I do ragtime stuff, I unfortunately always try, maybe not unfortunately, but it's not even just ragtime. If I'm doing some arrangement of somebody's piece, um, I'm trying to be as, I'm trying to do something that the, the composer would approve of. I don't know, um, it, it, it's kind of snooty I guess, but it also is, um, I'm not necessarily trying to make it my own as much as bring his, his, uh, his strange piece into the world of the guitar. Now, something that happens when I'm either doing an arrangement that has not been done on the guitar before or that I haven't heard a good one of, um, or composing an original piece, there isn't that net, the safety net, of knowing that somebody else has already played this. It's, it's of course possible. Because I always feel like if there's anything anybody can do out there, I can do, I'm thinking. So if, if, I, if I can hear Tommy Emanuel do it or, or Gordon Lightfoot, I'm thinking, I know I can do that. Because but, but, it might take a lot of work. Now, um, with, I've had a couple of pieces that I wrote that ran into problems where I could hear creatively that it had to go a certain way, and I'm thinking, as soon as I'm putting it together, writing it down, I'm thinking, this is going to be really, really hard, and it's not going to be worth the time and trouble. It happened in, in, two of my songs pop into my head right off the bat. One was Cobble Creek. I'll elaborate more on that story later. It was the part because it's in drop D tuning. <laughs> Was that little section, and which was going to require bar shapes and D major and D minor shapes changing around at the same time. And I remember thinking, this is just going to be too much trouble. And I'm going to, I'm thinking about changing the part. I decided not to. I'm also running out of tape here, so if, if this if this cuts off, ah, it was a bad idea. Well, never mind. Let me let me get back to. Oh, the other one was Highway Robbery. As I was writing Highway Robbery, it's a 10-minute piece that includes bluesy, jazzy sections and pyrotechnic sections. I can't even remember any of them right now because it's a piece I've written off and said, you know what? I recorded it. I performed it live. I'm never doing it again. Um, but as I was writing it, I could hear the part that was coming up, and it needed the recuerdos tremolo. <laughs> and I remember thinking, oh man, I don't want to get my tremolo in good enough shape. It's too much work. To do that, if you if, to be a great tremolo player like Christopher Parkening or some of those guys, you just have to do it all the time. It's high maintenance. Anyway, um, I was thinking, I you know what, I I have to change this part. I can't put the time in right now to do that. Unfortunately, the artistic side of me took over and said, "Don't be a wimp." So, anyway, I brushed up on my tremolo, good enough to record it perform it a few times, and right now I have no idea how it still goes. Okay, where I'm going with this is the piece I gave up on 20 years ago. 
when I was playing a lot of ragtime stuff in the late 70s, uh, I was really captivated by doing my own arrangements because many of the ones I heard I didn't really like. I thought, God, that is so, that's so not like what I hear on the piano when I listen to to uh, the recording I got, or the early version, the recording I got was by Joshua Rifkin. He did three albums that came out in the early 70s. And uh, later got uh, the complete works by Dick Hyman. Should I, did I show you that a couple weeks ago? Not sure. Anyway, um, and, and then I hear pieces like this. Beautiful stuff. Trope bouquet, you've heard me mess with this before. I had to abandon uh, what was going on there with Heliotrope as it got just way too noisy here in the neighborhood, just as well, because I was about to try to play this thing that I, I swore was impossible 20 years ago, and it's still impossible. But I'm going to get to a little bit more of this story, and that is that uh, getting back to the two original pieces that had complicated parts in them, there was a bit of frustration, even, even uh, Who Done It, when it had that walking bass part in there. A bit of frustration kind of entered the equation when I realized it was possible and I had to do it. Because there's kind of a little bit of closure, it's like if you just decide to write the whole thing off and say, never mind, not going like that, let's head off in a different direction. So, with this piece that I started on, it started working on in 1995, um, I was taken with it. It was one of the most beautiful tunes I had ever heard. It was haunting. And, um, and I thought, you know, i got to be able to play that on the guitar. I didn't really think the whole thing through and didn't it didn't seem to matter that it was it had five parts in five different keys only one or two of which are guitar friendly keys let me think we have F B flat those are the bad ones uh, B minor that's okay D and G okay so we had three relatively we have we had three of the five keys had one or two sharps in them and the other two had one flat or two flats anyway um, I guess I'm going, to I'm going to show you kind of what's going on with this. This tune uh, opens up, it, so aside from five parts and five different keys, it also had four, I think four, unusual transitions to get from one key to the next. Each one was very dissonant and chromatic and didn't fit well on the guitar. Uh, and then there was an intro, beautiful intro. I'm going to see if I can stumble through a little bit of this. But, this is such a work in progress. It wasn't until last week that I resurrected this and decided I have to put time in on this because it's, it's now going to be worth it. The, the giving up on it, it took me 20 years to get back to it, but I'm on it now. Let's see if I can get through it. Let me think. Got to find those harmonics. Got to, got to change gears. <laughs> That's just it. Let me see here. That's how it starts. Okay. how it's supposed to go. mention ridiculous stretches in this song then the first impossible part the biggest impossible part that I almost that had got huge clarity on just yesterday so this brand new fingering Thank you. 
so that's the part. That was in B flat, and that it still has. It's still obviously a work in progress, but it's getting there. So now, if you don't see any lessons next week, that's why. I gotta drive that thing home. Uh, I'll give you bits and pieces of the next couple couple parts. What happens at that point? It landed on. Plays the first section again. Anyway, that one ends and it gets weird. Oh, yeah, the next transition. Someday, maybe in a week or two. Okay, that's the end of my story for today. Hope you enjoyed uh, our little uh, excursion into the impossible. I don't know if it's impossible anymore, but I'm, I, uh, it just means that nothing else is getting done around here. By the way, the tune is called Bethina, 1905, written by Joplin shortly after, after his second wife died. Anyway, enough of that story. I will see you next week.